But hi, everyone. Uh, just a quick introduction on what we are going to talk about today. Um, so my name is Anka Baraji. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Checked. Uh, but this isn't necessarily about checked. I think it's we wanted to talk about the idea of um, commercializing SSI and what we see as the pitfalls, but also like, you know, through conversations we've had within the industry about the pitfalls uh, that might be involved if you try and look at building business, mo business models within self-sovereign identity. Um, so very happy to keep this as an interactive chat and understand like different viewpoints from, from people. So uh, please feel free to, free to use the raise hand feature or like the chat button to let us know. And uh, Alex, do you wanna give a quick introduction as well? Yeah, thanks Anka. So uh, I'm Alex Tweedell and uh, I'm working as the governance lead at Checked. Uh, so you guys might've seen a governance session I ran with Drummond yesterday. Um, just a brief bit of background. So I come from a legal background. So I specialized in data protection and privacy law and the GDPR. And that sort of brought me into the world of uh, SSI and being able to control your data. Uh, I've worked for a couple of startups uh, and then some leading projects in SSI, such as uh, the DHS project uh, in America. And uh, now I'm really excited to be here at Checked and on this uh, IIW chat with you today, Anchor. Sounds excellent. And so what we've called this is the, uh, what we've described as the seven deadly sins of uh, self-sovereign identity commercialization. Um, and hopefully what we can do is walk you through various aspects of walking through like, you know, sort of like, you know, what we look at when you look at commercializing SSI. One of the first things that stood out to me um, when I got into the space is the, the price of identity checks is quite high. And this impacts the self-sovereign industry as well, because a lot of different SSI projects or a lot of different, um, you know, projects that try to launch SSI are often downstream from ID check vendors. And what I mean by that is, at the moment, how do you currently originate SSI credentials? Um, now, if it's an original document, uh, such as when my, uh, you know, one of our one of our co-founders within the company, Fraser, when he was working with the Dutch and Canadian governments on making travel possible between Canada and in that case, it's the original agency or the government agency itself that was issuing a credential. But what what happens when you don't have that original authority or the body that issues your credential? How do you go prove that? And typically, what happens is. Um, just like right now, or just like how ID checks are done right now, um, the holder often has to provide PDF or paper documents or other certified documents, which are then run through with the identity verification API providers that exist around the world. Um, and that kind of check typically takes anywhere between minutes to weeks, depending on how automated it is or how uh, complex the check that you're carrying out is. And it often costs a fair amount of money as well per check as it goes along. And what that sort of like, you know, brings us to is um, in, in a lot of different conversations that I've had, like it's, it's a real problem for SSI projects because they're often downstream from providers like the Onfidos, the Trulios, and, and other ID checking services companies around the world, or they're carrying out the check manually by their own employees, there's a cost associated with carrying out the, or verifying that information that is being presented by the user. And just to give like a couple of different benchmarks, um, if you think about a basic KYC check, which is a selfie scan check, take a selfie, um, take a picture of your passport, and then it runs through through one of these providers that costs roughly anywhere between five to ten dollars. Um, a criminal record check, if which is a much more deeper enhanced check, costs anywhere between fifty dollars to a hundred dollars. Um, and then maybe if you go into more complex things like company background checks, then that can range anywhere between hundreds to thousands of dollars. But that's just the direct cost associated with carrying out that check, which the ID verification providers are charging. Quite often when um, there's a company that wants to issue SSI credentials, not only will they have to spend money on carrying out the basic check, but they'll have to 
go buy software or, you know, all of, a lot of us on the call might be from SSI companies, they'll have to go buy that particular software, they'll have to go do digital transformation to enable and change their processes to issue SSI credentials. Um, and they might even need to carry out a whole bunch of stuff within their own organization that has an added cost to them. So it's not necessarily just about covering the cost of the infrastructure, which in the case of DIDs, for instance, could be, you know, low. Uh, but it's also about like, you know, when you get down to the level of like actual credentials itself, what is that figure and what is that amount? And so what we sort of like, you know, you know, envision within this, you know, space that can actually make SSI effective is if it was possible to have a privacy preserving credential that could be somehow charged um, and the per charge sort of like, you know, check is significantly lower than uh, what you have in identification as you do it right now, the cost of that is spread out over multiple users. So for instance, if a company, uh, let's say a bank has just been followed, uh, and they issued me a credential that they can, that I can go reuse somewhere else. Um, but that is a credential that I own and I can choose whom to share with. And I go and use that five times uh, at the cost of say $1 to the receiving organization. The receiving organization has therefore received that like ID or verified ID at one fifth the cost of like what it would have um, cost them to go with something like a non fido. Um, I've had the ability to share that easily and port that data across um, while the while giving an incentive for the issuer themselves to be able to have a reason to go issue the SSI credentials in the first place. And uh, sorry, are you moving the slides, uh, Alex or? Am I, is, is it flickering? It's not, on it's not on my side. I, I think it's flickering on yours. Okay. Um, and so what well, that sort of like, you know, brings me to is like, you know, the, the, the second sin sort of is to try and make self-sovereign identity free as in beer and not as in speech. Uh, now, some of you may recognize this terminology from the free software movement. Um, where the, 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 the whole sort of like in a uh, chasm between is it open source software or is it free software and what does that actually mean? And one of the terminology was like free as in beer, which is like it does not cost money versus free as in speech, which is, is it philosophically something that you can build upon and remix and, you know, collaborate together, build an open system, open ecosystem where the data has been built. And I think one of the problems is to try and make it free as in beer, the problem is it doesn't give incentives for the issuing organizations to give those credentials out in the first place. But how does this actually then translate into what's happening elsewhere in the industry? Um, now, to take a quick example, like one of the companies that has got into the identity game quite recently is Stripe. You might have heard of them. They're one of the largest sort of card acquirers in the world, a bit like PayPal. Uh, so they have a new product called Stripe Identity, which allows uh, merchants or online you know, sites that use the Stripe product to verify a person's identity. And what's quite interesting is like they have, because they're one of the largest card processors in the world, they have a lot of different signals based on which they can carry out those ID checks. And what's quite interesting is when you look at the price point that they're charging and to, the, to what I was saying, um, if you could drive the per price uh, or the per sort of ID check cost down much lower than what it is at right now, the, the five to $10 range, if you, if you can get that down to say 30 pence, 30 cents or 10 cents, what happens is it becomes significantly a larger addressable market, which can start then using verified identity, which I think ultimately increases the number of places where a self-sovereign identity gets used. Um, and if the self-sovereign identity uh, is, there's there's demand for it from people, then, you know, there's, there's, there's an aspect of it, which is, which is simple. And 
It's, I will completely agree that SSM is not any kind of, uh, you know, trustworthy number, but that's, that's exactly where a lot of different organizations work on. Like the default in a lot of uh, manual processes is to rely on stuff like that. But I guess the more fundamental point that I was trying to make is that the, the price point of like verified ID checks through companies like the Onfidos and the Trulies of the world, by definition, limits it to use cases, say in finance or in KYC, where they have to do it because of a regulatory reason and because they have to go spend that money. Um, but Stripe is a good example of like, you know, something that is offering an ID product at a much, much, much lower price point. And therefore it's viable for a much larger segment, for instance, like e-commerce, where for instance, if you were trying to spend five to $10 per transaction in an e-commerce transaction to understand is this a real user who's buying a product um, or is this a fraudster who's perhaps stolen somebody's credit cards the the fact that like you know the the cost of like you know verifying the identity of the user has been pushed much further down is what makes it viable in a whole new different market segment and what what's quite interesting is i think ssi is not just useful in high friction use cases which is the uh, which is the KYCs of the world. I don't go and open bank accounts that often, but I'm quite regularly perhaps going into an e-commerce merchant, an e-commerce website and trying to verify that like, you know, I'm a real person who's buying it and not just a fraudster who's used a stolen credit card to buy an 800 pound uh, iPhone, uh, which the merchant will lose, like they've lost the expensive item and perhaps get hit by a chargeback later on, it just suddenly unlocks the ability to have, say, um, the ability for SSI to be used in a lot more different places. And, but having said that, I don't think, you know, commercializing SSI or charging for credential usage necessarily mean locked, locked credentials. Um, and what I mean by locked credentials is you have to make a payment before you can see this particular credential. I think um, some diff some ecosystems might go and might opt for an, uh, opt for a system like that, but it kind of violates the principle of like I have a digital credential that I control and I can share with someone and therefore prove some attributes that might belong to me. Um, so an analogy that I give over here is, for example. If you have a driver's license, you can go take that to a grocery store or when you're buying, say, alcohol, and you can show it to the person at the till to prove that your age is above 18. Now, what they do is they check the, this looks like a legitimate looking document. It has all of the different security features on it. And I believe in like the, the age, therefore, that you're sort of presenting across to me. They don't necessarily need to know if the credential is actually valid. And what I mean by that is I could have a plastic driver's license in my hand that has expired, uh, but a legitimate document or a legitimately issued document at some point in time. Um, but for the purposes of giving my ID, that could still be used. So if you think about it, in that particular use case, what matters is the fact that yes, you had a driver's license that was actually issued by say a government agency and therefore it attests that your age is above X. But let's take a different example. If you have, uh, if you have that same driver's license and you go along to a car rental agency and you want to rent a car, on that particular occasion, not only do they need to know is physically this document that you've just presented in front of me, is that a legitimate document or not? But we might also need to determine is, is it really valid? Because I could have a driver's license that it has an expiry date of 2034, but has actually been revoked because I moved my address and therefore I've been issued a new one, or it was reported as lost. So I am not in possession of it anymore. I was a subject of that particular driver's license. I'm not in possession of it anymore, somebody else does. Uh, so therefore I call up the government agency. I say like, you know, can you please revoke that particular driver's license? Um, so the car rental agency does need to know it not only is the information presented valid at the time it was issued, uh, but it also is it valid right now. And the expiry date on its own, if it's presented on a credential does not solve that problem because you can, you can have a scenario 
where there are things like passports or driver's licenses, which have an expiry date far into the future, but are not actually active documents. And so one of the ideas that sort of we've been exploring within the space is how do we uh, how do we solve the problem of like not necessarily creating a locked credential, but giving the ability, for instance, say you have a credential that you can share with anyone and that's up to you. That's as a holder, it's something that you can choose. The recipient of that credential, so the verifier, the verifier then has a choice. The verifier can see that it's a valid presentation or it's a valid credential. They can see that it was issued by a trustworthy issuer. But if they want to see whether the credential itself is valid right now, what they need to check is the revocation status of the credential. And the revocation status of the credential is the bit that's actually um, noteworthy or valuable that is happening in this transaction. And if you, if you meter something like that, wh where you arrive at is something like a freemium model where everyone is, as a subject holder, free to present the credential to someone. But if as a verifier or as a receiver of that credential, if you want to check if that is still valid, that's when you pay money. And that money that you pay uh, for carrying out the revocation check is ultimately something that can be moved to a price point that is much, much, much cheaper than what traditional ID verification providers can do right now. So I hope that makes a, sort of like in a sense so far, uh, but one of the ways that I sort of like, you know, go and uh, describe this is what I call like the SSI flywheel for adoption. And what I mean by that is by creating a better user experience for privacy and security, more people will demand to use SSI, which means more people will accept SSI. But to make that happen, what, in, what we need to ensure is the first part, which is how do we get more organizations, more companies to be issuing SSI credentials in the first place? Um, and part of that is like, you know, how do you uh, lower the costs for creating that data? And so if the cost of like, you know, creating that data, if they can issue you a credential and it does not cost them $5 to like get the identity details checked in the first place, if it costs them 10 cents, then they're more incentivized to issue you a credential. But what that also means is that the people downstream who are consuming it therefore have lower prices. What's important here is that I don't think it's necessarily checked or any particular company that is working within the SSI space that should fix that price. It's up to a credential issuer to decide what value it is that they want to put upon themselves in terms of um, what it takes to unlock, say, the credential or unlock the revocation status. And in a, in a, in a marketplace economy, what you'll naturally see is there will be uh, credential issuers who charge a very high amount or a very low amount, um, but they might be carrying out checks to a different level or they might be checking different things. Uh, it might be directly associated with like how complex it is to carry out that check. So um, in a marketplace economy, what you will find is like there's naturally going to be uh, a demand and supply thing that is being filled in on like, you know, what should be the, what should a majority of like, you know, those prices be at. Um, which brings me to the next obvious question that often comes up when thinking about uh, commercialized SSI or any time you talk about payments related with identity, which is um, there is a huge risk of correlation being a privacy risk because payments that can be correlated back to an individual can leak the identity of the individual itself. And so one way of like, you know, thinking about it is um, you know, traceability in, in a blockchain network is quite often a good thing. Like what the picture that I'm showing to you is what happened on the poly network hack. So if you didn't hear this new story, this is a couple of like, I think about a month ago at this point when um, this, um, I think DAP of some kind called poly network got hacked. Uh, they lost like, you know, crypto to the tune of about like, you know, $600 million. Uh, but when people tried, when the hacker for this particular uh, hack tried to extract it out, there were people who had visibility on where every single payment was flowing within 
minutes and hours. Like, you know, this is this is a graph of like, you know, how those payments flow through. And what you find is like, you know, because the on-ramps and off-ramps to crypto are often KYC'd and regulated, um, it's very hard to get away with something like that. So that sort of like traceability on a blockchain is quite nice. But this is where the challenge starts happening. When you when you then start like, you know, mixing the concept of the identity of an individual or an identifier for an individual with payments, um, there can be a lot of like, you know, problems with correlation. So uh, to take an example, if you think of the Ethereum name service, uh, the Ethereum name service is something, if you haven't heard of it, you can get something like a domain name. So you can have an identifier. So I could have like anchor.eth and say that is linked to this particular Ethereum wallet address. Um, so if you think of like the, 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 the challenge here is like, yes, it, the, you know, makes life simpler. Now it's easier for me to remember if somebody wants to pay me or if somebody wants to transfer an NFT to me, then they don't have to remember a very long hexadecimal string. They have a very easy alias through which they can address me the same way that we have domain names. Um, but the problem also then, therefore, is if you use something like ENS for any kind of identity payments or identity transactions, um, then there's a correlation risk because anytime, even if you have a cold wallet of some sorts that is not necessarily linked to an Ethereum name service address, um, if at any point you carry out a transaction with that particular address, it can all be correlated back. So how are we thinking of like uh, getting around the specific problem of how uh, there's there's a risk of like, you know, the, the privacy of the individual being leaked. Um, and for, for example, actually to, to bring up the other one, um, you could have, for instance, an issuer who prices a credential very precisely to say eight decimal points and then keep a record on their side that if a payment comes through for this exact amount, I know that credential belongs to Anka Banerjee or to Alex Tudel. Um, so even if you have like, you know, the, the, the ability to say um, there's an atomic payment that is happening, but it is not actually linked to an identifier for you on a ledger, there can be ways and perhaps like, you know, the issuer can correlate this back. And so one of, our, one of the ways that we've been thinking about this is to not necessarily make atomic payments for every single individual transaction, especially because of that risk where the issuer of a credential could price this very precisely and then correlate back. Um, but to think of this as a, maybe um, a net settlement model. Um, and one of the examples that I bring over here is something called TransferWise. They've now rebranded to WISE and they created a system where you, know, you can transfer money cheaply across different borders and between different currencies. But the way they actually do it is like for every individual payment, say Jane wants to send 500 pounds to the U 500 pounds to USA and the recipient uh, has to get it in dollars, they're not actually carrying out that exchange atomically for every single transaction. What they're essentially doing is they have a balance which is maintained in pounds in a country and a balance which is maintained in dollars in another country. And they essentially net it out. So there are people from the US say trying to transfer money to the UK. Um, that comes out of the UK pound balance. And there are people who want to get paid say in dollars in the US that comes out of the US balance. And then that can be um, automatically settled. And um, yes, you're absolutely right. Like it, like ACH in 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 the US does exactly this. Most uh, banking systems around the world, when you think of like how banks actually transfer money across each other, they're not literally transferring. Say, if I send ten pounds to Alex, they're not literally sending it across every single time. What they're doing is they're using a clearinghouse model where they effectively netting out the payments between different providers, and by Creating a payment model, perhaps where um, the say if the the verifier or the receiver of a credential has to pay an issuer, but they're not atomically paying it per transaction, but there's a netting system that is being used. Um, the 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 fact that payments are being made in aggregate between the verifier and the issuer could be one way of ensuring that the privacy of the individual is maintained. 
Um, now, what's quite important here, of course, is, is ensuring that the way that the revocation status is, is handed out is also done in a privacy preserving fashion, because um, if it's the issuer holding on to that revocation log, they can regardless see which verifier reached out to them. So it shouldn't necessarily sit with the issuer themselves, like there, there have to be privacy preserving revocation mechanisms that are used. But if I, as an issuer, know for a fact that there's this system in the middle that will ensure that I am paid what I'm due, but it is carrying out those actions in aggregate, um, then we can solve some of that problem, which comes across if you're trying to make payments directly for that specific um, transaction. Um, now, one thing also I want to clarify there is we don't necessarily think that like a verifier paying an issuer is the only model that exists because there could be other scenarios, for instance, um, I pay 60 pounds to get a passport. So if somebody wants a copy of my passport, then as the holder of the credential, maybe they should pay me. Um, whereas in some other scenarios, you might have a system where the, the verifier pays the issuer directly. So um, it's, it's not to say, uh, it, so, so we, I don't think like the right answer when trying to think of commercial models in SSI is to say that is the only way it can work. I think it needs to be flexible enough because identity ecosystems are quite different around the world. Um, and within an ecosystem say, for, so for instance, the, the, the cost of a KYC check in the UK is very, very different from say a company file in the US or an insurance file in the US. And that's very different from say, maybe the cost of a boarding pass in, in Singapore. Um, and maybe perhaps, you know, very different from what should be the, the cost associated with, you know, verifying this is an authentic Glastonbury concert ticket. So I don't think like, you know, a single model saying that like only verifier paying an issuer or only the verifier paying a holder are the, uh, needs to be dictated across the network. I think like the system or the me mechanism itself needs to be flexible enough um, to account for various different economic models that come up across the world. Um, and then to bring to the fact that like, you know, I mean, uh, is the, the second sort of like, I think sin that happens within this space is being fanatic about your ledger or like my ledger is better than your ledger or like my did method is better than your did method. Um, having said that, obviously, like, you know, we are building a product on a specific ledger and, and a specific DID method. Um, but I think what's quite important to think about there is um, a lot of like, you know, for, for realistic reasons of like, you know, what can you go deliver soon and what can you make happen soon? Um, often like, you know, uh, companies and SSI companies around the world that are building on this pick a particular DID standard or pick a particular method to carry out and issue these credentials. Um, but I think realistically, people don't necessarily care which DID method some their credential is anchored on or, or realistically, like the end user does not care about that. What they care about is, so I've got this digital credential, you promised me I have it in my app, um, where can I go use it? And can I go use it easily? So for instance, like in, in our thinking, while we are currently working on the Cosmos ledger, I'm not religious about Cosmos in particular. I'm not, <laughs> or like within our team, we are not specifically looking at, well, that's the only ledger, like, you know, that is the best one we have to, everybody must come across to that. Um, we, we, chose about, we chose it within our own particular, you know, making to say this is something that is a bounded problem and we can go solve it on that particular method. And then once we've figured out how to make it more general, uh, we should absolutely look at on how we solve the problem of payments for SSI credentials um, across every single ledger, every single DID method, and even not, I guess, non DID or non blockchain DID methods like carry. And I think that's something important to account for. And um, part of that, for instance, is to look at like, you know, I mean, the, the SSI industry has evolved fairly rapidly. And, um, you know, some of the biggest adoption there has obviously been with Hyperledger Indie, um, but there's a relative like, you know, problem in the, in, the, in the sense that a lot of Hyperledger Indie itself was designed before the W3C specifications were created. And so there are aspects of like, you know, some of the largest 
SSI networks in the world that aren't necessarily up to the same specification. Um, and uh, so one of the ways that we so want to solve that like you know particular problem is to say, well, yes, okay, we we have created our own did standard and that always always reminds me and I remind this within my own engineering team all the single time. this is an XKCD comic, which is um, this is exactly how standards proliferate, right? There are 14 competing standards and then you come across like 14, this is ridiculous. We need our own power socket or we need our own USB-C charger. And then suddenly you have 15 competing standards. And, and that is what creates part of that problem. I think there's about like a hundred plus DID methods at the moment. Um, but what like, you know, we get to then is, is the, how do we then like, you know, actually look at like not turning into what I call planet of the apps, um, planet of the app ship. Um, any bets on how many times the XCCD comic? Yeah, I, I bet uh, loads. Um, but even if you think of like, you know, the things that are built on the same DID method, or even if you think about the same, they're all using Hyperledger Aries. Realistically, what you often find is that different SSI wallets or apps don't necessarily work with each other, um, or they don't necessarily work with the same backend. And so there are aspects of it which often remain quite proprietary, um, that I think we need to solve for as an industry. And I think that's true for both the identity piece, but also the payment piece. And also like, you know, not to forget the fact that like a lot of people will have their own um, credentials in old, say cloud-based or like legacy, like, you know, identity providers. So how do those get migrated across? And some of the more interesting stuff that I've seen happen in the space is uh, Condatus, for instance, has been creating, and as well as Matter, have been creating a bridge that can translate between, say, um, OpenID Connect and verifiable credentials. Now, you're obviously trusting them at that point to say, yes, we have accurately you know, created that transform. And, and in essence, they are almost becoming an issuer on, on that particular exchange that takes place. Um, but it's quite important to look at like, how does this all tie together and work together? And the analogy that I often take in this space is, um, some of you might be familiar with a term called open banking, which is, uh, which is a standard across Europe on how any bank account provider or current account provider must give access to people uh, to be able to see, um, to, to fetch their financial transactions into their FinTech apps and so on. And so what's quite interesting is like, if I uh, have a bank account or a FinTech app, I can go into the FinTech app, I click connect to my bank account, it automatically throws me to my bank app, I approve it within the bank app, and then I'm thrown back to my actual ID wallet. And that kind of like, you know, interoperability perhaps is being thought about like, hey, this is, this is, this is, this is a verifiable credential, it's written to a standard and therefore anybody can read it. But what's perhaps not being thought about as much is I have a credential in one ID wallet and I have a different set of credentials in a different ID wallet, but the verifier is asking me for a combination of those two. So how do you, uh, how do you share that across and how do you perhaps even port between different apps? And that kind of like in a challenge, you know, besides the payment point, I think like, you know, comes out on its own. And um, Part of like the, you know, the answer was supposed to be, let's, let's use Hyperledger Aries. It's supposed to be ledger agnostic. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be workable with every single verifiable data registry. And that solves interop, right? Uh, right. <laughs> um, and the reality often is that like a lot of the Aries implementations are quite strongly linked to quite specifically Hyperledger Indy and often to the sovereign network itself. Um, so one of the ways that we've been thinking about it is to work on the airy stack itself to say we are building, say, our own uh, DID method within checked, uh, but we want to make the exchange part of that work with Hyperledger Aries so that anyone who is currently using Indie creds can continue using Indie creds, but anyone who uh, wants to use our new method can also use that within Hyperledger Aries, but more broadly. Uh, because the the DID method that we're creating is more you know, is up to date with the uh, W3C specifications, 
the act of then extending that to other non-checked uh, DID methods should also be simpler. And we, you know, that's that's one of the ways that we've been trying to think about like this particular problem around uh, standards. And that brings me to like, well, could you say interoperability one more time. And um, Alex, do you want to take over for this specific bit and walk us through the final like two deadly sins, and then we can maybe go to uh, the 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 questions. Yeah, I, I'm not sure this video is going to work too well on uh, for for the rest of the people. I think it might look a bit choppy, but uh, essentially uh, the sixth deadly sin is that utopian visions uh, cloud real usability. And uh, I think if you go onto the next slide, Anchor, we'll probably be able to explain it more easily on that slide. Um, so essentially the problem here is, you know, what we're building at checks is we, we want to build a token. And I, I think we've made it clear through this presentation, but what we want to do is build a token to be able to use for uh, incentivizing uh, credential transactions. So if an issuer wants to uh, share a credential uh, no, if, it, if an issuer issues a credential to a holder and a credential presents that in a holder presents that credential to a verifier, then there'll be a payment flow uh, for that credential. And what we're building is a token rail or a token uh, to underline that uh, the payment ecosystem. The problem with building a token is uh, one of the problems is the Elon problem. So you don't want to have serious price volatility uh, within the token. Um, and that's something really, really important to mitigate for real usability, because if you use a, you know, a token such as Bitcoin to, to do payments, like is what's currently happening uh, in El Salvador, where they've recently uh, said that Bitcoin is legal tender, the price of a credential or the price of anything will fluctuate on a day-by-day -by -day basis, which is obviously unworkable in the real world, especially when we're talking about uh, regulated industries. So I think uh, one of the solutions to uh, the Elon problem, and if you go on to the next slide, please anchor, uh, is uh, looking at layer two and stable coins. Um, so I think it's, it's essential that if you want to have a, a workable token that undermines or underpins the flow of verifiable credentials, it needs to be backed by something or it needs to be at least stable in its value. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're not going to achieve something that's actually realistic. Um, I think that sort of ticks that piece off anchor, if you, unless you have anything else to add there. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, you know, um, so if you are trying to, say, have an identity transaction um, or uh, you, you have an ID exchange taking place and you're saying, OK, cool, like, you know, somebody needs to pay for the revocation check, um, if it is denominated in an unstable currency or like a store of value currency that like you know fluctuates a high amount, then that creates perverse incentives to perhaps not carry out an ID check today. Maybe I received a credential today and it's like, oh well, like you know, the fiat value of this is um, you know, currently it's a hundred dollars, but you know what? I bet Elon will tweet next week and it'll be 200 then. Um, so you know what, I, I'll, I'll try and like, you know, cash it in at that particular time. Um, so it does create these like, you know, tensions within the model where um, the, the economics of it is quite unstable. And so um, one of the parts of our thinking there is, do you use a stable coin, which is uh, you have a stable-ish coin, like, you know, perhaps every single ecosystem could decide with its, uh, within its own governance or layer two principles and say, uh, you know what, like, you know, the, the price of an ID check for the Finnish or the Nordic, like, you know, banking ecosystem is this, or the price of an ID check in the UK banking ecosystem is this, and they decide on that together. Uh, but the price of like an insurance file in the US is not $5 per check, it's $100 per check, say. Um, and they have the flexibility to do that because perhaps they have their own internal currency. But then you just sort of reduce the problem from like uh, one global currency, which by the way, we are not trying to create um, for, for identity payments down to now you then have price volatility, perhaps like, you know, like, you know, less volatile, uh, but still it's, it's a fluctuating sort of like in a value. Or one of the other things that we've been thinking of is instead of a stable space coin, 
uh, we can also you know look at this in terms of stable coins which is there are stable coins like uh, USDC that exist which are relatively a lot more stable because they are pegged against a certain fiat currency and especially if you're making not micro payments but you're making payments in aggregate between different parties uh, the the economics of that work out a lot better and one of the ways that you can therefore make it work is to say the the the, the price of like say an id check can be kept relatively stable and that keeps the economics of a particular ecosystem working well but if you extrapolate that onto how there are now dexes and DAOs that that you know run relatively autonomously you can extend that to say perhaps the payment itself is not made in a designated stable coin but it could be designated in whatever currency a, a verifier wants to pay and whatever currency an issuer wants to receive and there's something like a DEX that sits in the middle and that translates it for them. That's how we currently do foreign exchange. And of course, there will be uh, some level of like what volatility that comes in with the with the what's the what's the exchange rate that uh, for a particular currency or like a particular currency pair. But there are mechanisms in which the the problem of is am I relatively assured that I'm paying, eh, well, you know, roughly 50 cents for this particular transaction can be handled. Alex, back to you. Yeah, no, I think going on to the final sin now and uh, talking about uh, things that have come up probably a million times over the, uh, the last 72 hours, obviously the, the New Yorker cartoon of on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, uh, is a classic, but uh, specifically with decentralized identity, uh, it's vet, like nobody knows that natively that the did that you own does not relate to a dog. You know, it, with with de decentralized ID ecosystems, you're relying on a governance ecosystem and trust framework to say, okay, maybe your did is registered in this trust registry, and that's how I will know that you're not a dog. Uh, but if, if there's no such ecosystem and, and trust registry uh, to give a level of legitimacy to uh, the DID, then it's sort of how, how do you verify that the person behind the DID is actually who they claim to be? So you need to have um, a sort of root of trust and uh, sort of assurance framework for uh, pr providing that a person is actually who they claim to be on that point. Um, and you know, just having uh, a verifiable credential that says I am Alex Tweedale um, maybe isn't desirable. One of the things that Anchor and I were thinking is, you know, reputation here is incredibly important, and building up reputation in in your own identity is almost just as important and on an equal playing field to uh, having uh, verified attributes and claims about yourself. Um, so we, when we do progress into an SSI ecosystem in the real world, um, not only do you need to have a trusted uh, DID, which is potentially listed in a trust registry somewhere, but you should also probably have uh, a level of reputation about your own uh, identifier and your own credentials that uh, attest to your actual, your actual being yourself. Um, Anka, what, what are your thoughts here as well? I'd be keen to hear what you have to say. Yeah, of course. And I think it comes back to obviously, like the XKCD comic, I've probably overused this many, many times. Uh, comes from that, like, you know, New Yorker uh, cartoon on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Um, the, the reason why I brought, that, brought this up is, of course, we are trying to build this, like, you know, vision of like what a uh, decentralized identity looks like. But how do you know the uh, dids of trustworthy issuers? The reality is, in a lot of different ecosystems right now, this is a essentially shared around in the trust framework, like somebody shares an email or like a file or like, you know, something that says these are the different issues that we trust. Um, the other method that I've seen is, uh, for instance, maybe you put it in a well known uh, domain name, you put it in as a DNS record and you say, this is my did and because I can prove and that I've had this domain name for a long time I'm bootstrapping the, 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 the trust in that particular did um through something like the domain name the challenge or like you you go or you go to a trust registry 
the challenge that I see with that is like, at the end of the day, it then comes back to a centralized system again, or it comes back to centralized PKI uh, to, to, to an extent. And at that point, we might as well go home and say, what's the point of DIDs? Like, if you are going to use that way of like bootstrapping the trust in the DID, then just use the centralized register. Um, so that's a challenge that we've been thinking about as well. And um, to, 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 to sort of like, you know, summarize it, um, right now, if I have a contract with an ID verification company like say some one of the large names, um, I have a contract with them. So they are contractually obligated to deliver me uh, information within a certain SLA to a certain quality. And if it turns out like, you know, that, that co the quality of the information is bad, fine. Like, you know, uh, if it's something like KYC, I, I'm the one who gets hit by a fine. But I still have like, you know, some contractual relationship to understand, okay, this is what I'm uh, expected to get. The lack of like, you know, that kind of like being able to learn, how do you uh, score the reputation of a DID itself? Um, it, has it been sort of like an you know, auto-generated? Perhaps it's an imposter. Perhaps it's an imposter DID because uh, we see this in like phishing attempts and domain names a lot. Like, you know, people create lookalike domain names, which um, seem like the real thing, but don't actually belong to the real authority. So we started like, you know, thinking about like, you know, how do you then like create a uh, trust within the did itself in a decentralized fashion? And one of the answers around that has come from the old idea of like web of trust, which is you have proof of authority through people who have vouched for you over a certain period of time. And this is what like something, uh, some systems like ACDC and Kerry are looking at as well. But proof of authority on its own doesn't necessarily mean uh, you uh, continue being a trustworthy issuer. And what I mean by that is through proof of authority or through the web of trust of like, you know, people vouching for you, you might have built up a good, like, you know, like authoritative, uh, um, you know, standing within a particular network and people trust you. And, you know, it's you, we, I obviously trust the uh, credential that comes across from your side. But then what happens if like, you know, tomorrow that particular a uh, trustworthy issuer gets acquired by a hedge fund company that says, fantastic, we've acquired this very trustworthy asset. Now let's just cut corners and, you know, issue credentials really nearly at, at like, um, um, you know, without really caring about the quality anymore. So proof of authority does not necessarily uh, account for a scenario where you may have been trustworthy, but you then decide to change your policies. Maybe you get acquired by someone, maybe for whatever reason, like the, there's something that causes the, the quality of the credentials that you're issuing to degrade. And currently there's no way of necessarily imposing a penalty if that happens. And one of the aspects of like, you know, where the, 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 you know, building a commercial model for SSI is how do you solve that particular liability challenge? And if we were able to link, say, the, the aspect of, say, the reputation of uh, a DID, um, the, the issuer DID, to perhaps some sort of financial stake that they have. So not only is it like authority that you can add on to that, but you can also add on there's some financial stake on the line if they misbehave or if the network believes they're misbehaving or the, the, the quality of their credentials have dropped. If there's a way to asymmetrically, without necessarily having legal contracts, have some mechanism to have a, a, a penalty that the, that the issuer, say, for instance, is liable for, that then starts building in the mechanisms of business trust that exists right now in how ID verification gets carried out. Uh, so I agree with, you know, I mean, you know, nobody on the internet knows your data as a dog, but also uh, like I think uh, Joe said, um, nobody on the internet knows that your data is a bot. Or I, I believe as somebody at IBM said, nobody on the blockchain knows that you're a refrigerator. Uh, Alex, over to you. And I think those are all the slides that we had. I think that's the end. Yeah, I think like at this point, I think it'll be really good to open it up to discussion though. We've chatted a lot about our 
thoughts about how we can make SSI potentially commercially viable and how we can maybe address some of these glaring issues that, uh, that SSI is facing when it comes to commercialization and, uh, and incentives. But I'd be keen to just open it up to everyone who's listened so far and to, to gauge your thoughts and see if you guys have any really good ideas about how we can uh, do payments for SSI going forward as well. Um, and I think there's a lot of questions coming in the chat as, so we can start to go through them. I was trying to read them as we go along and like answer some of them. So um, yeah, I, I think I think the I think what what's what's quite fascinating to me is is there's there's a, there's this whole like crypto world um, which looks has has traditionally put like everything on ledger. And SSI is one of those use cases where you don't put necessarily everything on ledger because that's a terrible idea. And that's terrible from like a privacy and data regulation compliance perspective. Um, so there's this bubble that like, you know, I mean, is, is, is you know, and, and as things like, you know, NFTs and perhaps like, you know, some Ethereum based systems have become more popular. Some of the choices they're making is let's just put everything on ledger because that's what we've done for previous blockchain use cases. Um, and I think that's quite dangerous, but I think the, 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 the combination of perhaps having reputation systems that or reputation that is mentioned or uh, maintained on ledger along with a financial sort of like, you know, a stake associated with it, along with the, uh, the, the credentials themselves that can live off ledger and therefore in a more, in a more private fashion. Um, I think the combination of that is quite powerful. Um, this also reminds me of like a pretty a new, new sort of like, uh, sort of like, you know, blog post that came out from Andreessen Horowitz, which, which spoke about, you know, you can, if, if you, if you were able to just buy reputation, uh, because you've bought like uh, an NFT, like, you know, I mean, the example that we used was, um, you, you know, sometimes like NFTs are used as badges to get into such particular like Discord channels. If you could just buy the NFT, if you could just buy the reputation, then that reputation system collapses. So you often have to have this like, like, you know, linkage between you need to look at authority, you need to look at how authority degrades over time, you need to look at like, you know, mechanisms in which um, perhaps the the reputation itself like you know could be imposed as a financial penalty so for instance um if i issue a credential uh, you receive it and then it turns out to be a lemon then much in the same way that you can go to your bank and say actually i want to put in a chargeback request because i received a lemon you should be able to for instance get refunded for the 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 the, the credential that you got paid for in the first place and just like how it works in like you know, card reputation networks, if too many people claim their money back and say, actually, like, you know, I mean, you, you keep on, you know, sending like, you know, credentials that are not fit for purpose, um, perhaps like the, your reputation gets slashed or perhaps the fees that you need to pay to be able to transact with others on the network goes up the same way that it does in the chargeback model. And so there's some very interesting things that can start coming into play to, to essentially build a reputation system linked to aspects of uh, decentralized identity um, that can be quite interesting. Yeah, there's an interesting discussion in the chat at the moment as well about how you can currently buy reputation and there's a fraud market, you know, based on scamming and phishing, sort of get an account and then maybe, you know, give reputation to another account. Um, do you think the, by having uh, verified identities uh, pegged to your account, it would negate uh, that sort of fraud market and that fraud reputation market because while you'd be able to, because you wouldn't be able to uh, fish away someone's verified identity as easy as the, as easy, easily as you would their username and password. Unless, unless you steal the steal their keys. What I often say is like Web 3.0 companies are built on the built on Web 2.0 foundations. Literally, all of us here use Zoom, Google, LastPass, like you know, a lot of Web 2.0 companies. At the end of that, uh, you know, getting into my account is probably phishing my Google password. So you could have like, uh, you know, reputation tied to an account, 
but if you could somehow get into my last pass or somehow get into my Google and like initiate an account reset, what you've done is, well, uh, like, like Joe said, there's a, there's a whole sort of like in a market in, in rep, reputable or stolen accounts on marketplaces like eBay or Airbnb. Joe, do you want to add something here? Like, I think that's- Yeah, exciting. no, so, so I, I just joined uh, about three months ago, uh, a new company, Arcos Labs, and, and we're in the fraud space. We're, we're really trying to figure out how to prevent, uh, really detect bots and, and automation. And, and one of the things I've been interested in uh, the South sovereign identity space for a while, uh, I was in, in advertising. And I think there is, we haven't really looked at the dimensions of how fraudsters can leverage if we move into a self sovereign identity, a decentralized identity market, uh, the, the potential risks in terms of sophisticated fraudsters. Uh, identity takeover, right? Once we make did usage easy for the consumer, it's gonna be also easier for fraudsters to take over the, those uh, identity, take over those wallets. And, and I think we need to think a lot more about about this whole whole area in order for this to, to succeed. I'd love to hear thoughts from other people as well. Stephen, I'm answering your question in text chat, but yeah, would love for people to join in and like add their own thoughts as well on what you know what stood out to you, questions. I mean, just an open question to the group. I mean, uh, do you guys see uh, like the commercialization uh, of verifiable credentials through uh, payment rails as being something that's needed? Or do you think that it's uh, doing something unnecessary for the SSI ecosystem? You know, do you think you should be able to charge for credentials uh, using something native or, or not? Uh, I'd be keen to hear people's thoughts on that as well. Um, my hypothesis has always been if you can't charge for things natively, then you end up with a lot of interesting and, and difficult problems because you really want to be able to clear all this data is not revoked atomically along with the movement or transfer of value. Um, when you can't do that, you have to do all sorts of interesting escrow and locking issues that have significant problems when, when you talk about exchanging information because once I've told you the information, I can't take it back. And so even the act of creating an escrow service tells some third party that this information exists. And now someone knows who probably shouldn't have known in the first place. So, you know, having some mechanism that's native to the cryptography or native to the, the source of revocation in your system that says, until the revocation check hasn't cleared, the payment won't clear. And when the payment clears, we know the information must clear. Um, uh, seems like a useful tool uh, in terms of making the system operate. Now, that being said, I think we're often not sophisticated enough in terms of how we think about the ledger and in terms of how we think about the state of the system. I think that uh, the blockchain really acts more like a semaphore or a mutex in an operating system. And there's nothing to say that the operating system needs to be aware or understand the contents of the pages in memory uh, in order to make the system function. In fact, it doesn't even have to have that information inside of its CPU cache, so to speak. Uh, and, and when we start thinking about the system like a smart contracts based system, or like a system where we track state on the blockchain, um, we get into a lot of problems with trying to force or force fit things into, you know, let's make it so that the data is encrypted or let's make it so they just can't read the data. And then the whole identity infrastructure falls apart in the sense that it doesn't survive human timescales, right? Because our cryptography is not good for 200 years. We have no way of proving that it will be. Um, and, but back to that same construct, if we try to say the did is the source of reputation or a quote unquote, the identity, we've also missed the point, right? Because really the way the system was constructed is to try to say cryptographic keys and identifiers and signed pieces of information are separate constructs so that you're not relying any or too much on any one piece. But if we take our verifiable credentials and say they're tightly coupled to the did, the system falls apart. If we take and say the reputation of your system relies on the identity, meaning the, the, the centralized identifier and not on the attributes that you assert against the identifier, again, the system falls apart. Um, just like the certificate authority system fell apart because the attributes had to be signed by the authority and you lost control of your cryptographic key management. You've got to keep the pieces relatively independent or you don't get where you want to go.
I think this is exactly how I would agree with you, Nathan. So it's one of the reasons why we didn't think of locked credentials as a way to do it because cryptography always goes out of date. Um, and I'm not even talking about like, you know, people often bring up quantum computers, forget that. Like, you know, like TLS, like standards that we used 10 years ago are now out of date uh, or like not considered secure enough. So anything that is presented as a locked or an encrypted credential will always get broken into. And you definitely run into that sort of um, race condition that might happen or like a deadlock that might happen on like the payment happens before X, uh, which is precisely why the analogy that I'm thinking of is the presentation or the credential should always be free and open to present to someone. And it's the same way that I can always take my driver's license and I can show it to someone and they can see that it used to be, even if it's a driver's license that is like 20 years old, you can still check that it was a valid document at that time. And in your particular use case, rely on it for say proof of age. Um, but, to, but to keep it restricted to just the uh, revocation registry or the revocation status check, um, that then decouples it from like, you know, using one single method. And I think realistically, it's not going to be a single revocation registry mechanism that works, but people will innovate around how the revocation registry is built and metered and, and run as well. And some will offer like, you know, different levels of like say privacy uh, than others, or like they'll, they'll handle escrow differently, or they'll provide say, the ability to pay in like 20 different fiat currencies directly instead of paying in a token. Um, and, you know, that's, 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 that's sort of like, you know, how I see this particular space evolving. Yeah, and I agree about the bearer, like a lot of credentials that we think uh, it's not my driver's license, like well, it kind of is my driver's license, but it's not really, it's, you know, technically Her Majesty's government who owns that or the passport. Um, but I think that is quite often true in a lot of different use cases. Also, I don't think like every single credential necessarily needs to be charged for. I genuinely think um, the, the origin credentials, often like government credentials will and should be free or like close to free because I've already paid for it as a taxpayer. Like that, that shouldn't cost me money to get. Um, but then the, 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 the generative credentials that happen down the chain as a consequence of that, where there are other uh, companies or organizations adding their own uh, stamp to it, that's the bit that might you know, require some business model. I also think it could be a really useful uh, business model for those companies that are using credentials in supply chains and products. Um, just thinking out loud, you know, um, if you if you're a company that you know issues packaging and you you use verifiable credentials to streamline the flow of that package along the supply chain, if you could have a charge every time that that package was checked and verified, and you could get a, a revenue stream through that, uh, that gives you know a whole new dynamic and a whole new business incentive for companies to use verifiable credentials, which have much greater benefits as well in terms of interoperability and you know standardizing everything in the same format in terms of uh in, in terms of supply chains so you know that's just another way and uh another sort of uh, angle for uh the, the commercialization of ssi and using a native payment system as well um anchors just said he's need to needed to drop off so i think we're probably going to uh wrap this conversation up